people. Welcome to Crypto Files Episode 3. We're here. This is uh, the Killbot. And uh, as always, our host is in the house. We have the Blind Squatcher. Ooh, there you go. I don't know if you guys can hear this, but it's windy as shit here. So if there's any like weird noises picking up on my microphone, that's what it is. Ooh, that's not Blind Squatter, right? That's Squatcher. No. Blind Squatter is this guy that lives down the street. Just squats. Yeah, squats and he squats and takes a poop on your lawn. So what's going on with you on this fine <laughs> spring, not, almost Easter Easter Eve? I guess we yeah, can say that. Yeah, I guess it is Easter Eve. Um, not too much. I'm glad I finally sound normal after I was that episode was rough. I sounded like shit, but that cold like held on for almost a month. I think. Oh, my gals had like that same cold. I swear she's had. <laughs> And Finally, it's, still, it's now. The ba- worst thing is, like, at night now, it's still, every once in a while, the voice. I'll just, like, lose my voice completely. Oh, and that's when you need your loud voice at night. Scream. I know, because I need to, like, start screaming cradle filth lyrics or something. Ah! Ghost in the fog! There you go. I, I like that song. It'd be good. We, it'd be good on a ghost hunt. Just go out and crank some cradle of filth. Oh, Not speaking of that. Thing. What is I didn't watch it, but or I don't know if you, I don't know if you post a video or not. You were talking about watching ghost shows with Lisa, but you'll sing the song about EMF meters or something. What was that? Oh, you know, you know remember the the late eighties, early nineties, the EMF song. Oh, unbelievable! Oh, is that what? The, oh, yes, I know the what you mean. I, I didn't realize it was called EMF. Okay, one hit wonders. Yeah, I didn't know that was the name. That is awesome. She's really sick of that because, like, like, every time they, you know, she watches like ghost adventures, and uh, I've been into paranormal, like old episodes of Paranormal State lately. And speaking but, of it, ghost adventures, I'm not going to get into it real. I mean, that much, but Zach Bagans did. Oh my God! Oh, Zach. Yeah, he did a documentary called The Demon House on this house he bought. That I think, I feel like we did it on the original show, but it was this family was being terrorized. Is, there's like police on record that said they saw a kid climb up the wall and stuff. But the documentary was so good, and I don't really like Ghost Adventures, but it was the most un-Ghost Adventures thing he's ever done. Oh, okay. I remember Jordan tagged us on Facebook about that, too. And So so it's a just a straight-up documentary. It's well, not like a the found first, footage or a... No, it's like an hour and a half. The first hour, I would say is just the story of the actual house. He goes and talks to one of the children and protective services people that was there and saw the child walk up the wall. Oh, man. And talks to a couple of the police officers that went on record with their names, mind you, experiencing things. And then the last, like, 20, 25, 30 minutes is him doing, like, a little bit of investigation. But that part's creepy. Like, I don't know. I... He's questionable, I think, at times, but this seemed really legit. Like, if you get if you get a chance, I would really check it out. I think you'd like it. It's not the same as his usual like ghost adventure stuff. Tonight, behind these walls, <laughs> we will see. He narrates it kind of like that, but it's not <clears throat> it's not the same type of thing. Cool. I never really liked that show, but I always thought his like narration voice like was good and like made you want to watch it. I always kind of. Well, what's that uh, found footage movie? It's fiction, of course. It's not. But um, where they're in the uh, insane asylum. There's two of them. What's it called? Um, Grave Encounters. I like Grave both Encounters. Of them. I always felt like they were kind of uh, ripping on him a little. Yeah. Was, a lot of people don't like the I second like the, one, but I did. Oh, I did too. That demon thing. Oh, yeah. Those movies are great. Someday, yeah. crypto. You got to do what we, we said. And we're gonna do some like cryptid in movies. You know, we could. Yeah, I was just gonna say some movies, a, couldn't we? You know. Yeah, you you can tell everybody what we were talking about because I was thinking of that too. Doing that, maybe doing some uh, commentaries. I mean, yes, maybe some reviews. Well, drink, they could definitely hey do drunken commentaries, and uh, so that, that I think that'd be kind of fun because uh, we're into the the paranormal. Uh, we'll say fan type movies too, just as much. Of, you know, do you know how much fun the potential of like commentating of found footage would be because both of us love found footage on top of everything else. But it's killing the genre. Yeah, we would have a good time, for sure. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I think in the next couple of weeks we should play in one of those. Let's start do it. it off. Let's definitely do it. So, 
Why don't you start off the show this week? All right, I'm going to kick it off here. Are we taking the jet or the boat or I forget how many vehicles we have. But... Um, we're going to have to take. <clears throat> well, I'm not. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not really sure what we'll have to take. But we're. <laughs> I'll tell you what we're going to find out, and because this is Easter Eve, so. Okay. This is the legend of. Hold on, I'm really slow here. My phone. Okay. It's the legend of the Bunny Man Bridge. Holy shit! Uh, so is that in California? I, I'm not sure. We're gonna. Or it is in wrong. Fairfax County, Virginia. So it's not oh. that far from you, really. I'm very off with my geography. <laughs> All right. We're driving to California. It was, it was a fucking Bunny Man Bridge. Uh, you're in the wrong part of the country. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Then. And it says, "What's so scary about Bunny Man Bridge?" And it says, "Only a hanging, several dozen homicides." And an ex murderer in a bunny suit. <clears throat> now there has to there was a movie like that, right? There has to have been a movie with a man in a bunny suit. Oh, yeah, I think there's been a few. Yeah, and this is on Colchester Road in Fairfax County, Virginia, just sat outside a small <clears throat> town of Clifton. Stands an unlikely tourist destination known as Colchester Overpass, unofficially known as dun, 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 Bunny Man Bridge. I would go there and try to get EVP. Says, to outward appearances, there's nothing remarkable about the site. <clears throat> it's Excuse one me. lane concrete tunnel beneath the railroad track, which what draws people to it, despite the fact that tourism is discouraged by local authorities, are about the tales of mayhem or murder told about the place. It says, what draws people to the legend of the Bunny Man? Well, who is the Bunny Man? The details vary in the telling here, but there are two b- basic variations of the story. One begins with the closure of a nearby insane asylum from which a busload of inmates were being transferred to another institution when two of the most dangerous escaped and hid in the woods. Despite a manna, they eluded authorities for weeks, leaving the half-eaten carcasses of rabbits in their wake. (coughs) Excuse me. Eventually, one of them was found dead hanging from the overpass. The other escapee, dubbed the Bunny Man or simply Bunny Man, was never found. Some say he was struck and killed by a passing train, and his ghost continues to haunt the overpass to this day, killing and mutilating innocent passerby. That sounds like the setup for like a YouTube short film that's found footage. Yeah, you ain't kidding. The other version begins with a deranged teenager who one day donned a white bunny costume, Aren't murdered they all deranged? his family, then hung himself on the overpass. What's that? Aren't they all deranged? All teenagers? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <clears throat> it's the spirit that haunts the bridge, chasing down the visitors with his axe and disemboweling them. <clears throat> Some 32 people have supposedly died there. That's a lot of people, I mean. That's a damn lot of people. <clears throat> Bunny Man sightings have been reported in other locales as well, not only in Fairfax County, but also in rural Maryland and in the District of Columbia. When not committing outright murder, he is said to have chased children with his axe, attacking adults in their cars and vandalizing property. Here we go. Is the Bunny Man real? And it says no. Not the Bunny Man of legend at any rate. No insane asylum has ever existed in or near Clifton, Virginia. <clears throat> That's according to archivist and historian Brian A. Conley, who extensively you, researched the Bunny Man stories. You kill Joy. Yeah, no, sh- yeah, you suck, dude. Anyway. Shut up. <laughs> nor is there any record of a local teenager murdering his family. No one has ever hung himself on Bunny Man Bridge, nor have any homicides occurred there. Like others who have attempted to verify these tales, Conley concluded they're false. In short, he wrote, the Bunny Man did not exist. However... I hope he gets attacked by a tulpa. Could real-life incidents have inspired the urban legend? On October 22, 1970, a curious story appeared in the Washington Post under the headline, Man in a Bunny Suit, Sought in Fairfax. According to the well, then it, maybe it wasn't murder, but there was a person in the bunny suit, at least. Yep, see? Okay. And it says, according to the report, a young man and his fiance <laughs> were in the car about on the 5400 block of Guinea Road, approximately seven miles due east of the Colchester Overpass, when they were accosted by a man dressed in a white suit with long bunny ears. After complaining that they were trespassing, he threw a wooden-handled hatchet through the right front car window and skipped off into the night. Just over a week later, the axe man with bunny ears was spotted again about a block away from where the first sighting had occurred. 
This time, he was standing on the front porch of a newly constructed house, hacking away at a roof support. It says here, this is how it was reported in the Washington Post. Paul Phillips, a private security guard for a construction company, said he saw the rabbit standing on the front porch of a new <laughs> unoccupied house. I started talking to him, Phillips said. He started talking. He said, all you people trespass around here, Phillips said. The rabbit told him as he whacked gashes into the pole. There is that word again. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to bust you on the head. Phillips said he walked back to his car to get his handgun, but the rabbit carrying the long-handled axe ran off into the woods. I wonder if his name was Peter Cotton. So he, would, he should have said he sprung off into the woods or hopped. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. So there is some basis here. So, yeah, there is killer, bunny, killer people in bunny rabbit costumes on this Easter Eve that we do have to be aware of. That's right. Um, take this jet too. I'm thinking. Um, all right. This is from Mr. Universe, and it is the strange phenomenon. <clears throat> excuse me, of the whistling Sasquatch. Over the years, this is by Nick Redfern. I guess I, sh- I should have read who it was by. He's awesome. His books are awesome. Like they're. Books are awesome. They have, like, so much information in them, but he always has a way of, like, ending his chapters where you can't wait to turn the next page. And his name is awesome. It's like he should be hunting warlocks. He would be someone I'd love to eventually interview, but, like, I don't know what I would ask him, but I think it'd be cool if we had him on. I would hunt warlocks with him. Hunting Warlocks by Nick Redford. No, Hunting Warlocks, A Practical Guide by Nick Redford. Yeah, going, like, mountain bike adventures hunting warlocks. Yes. Just putting it out there, Nick. Yeah, Nick, you know, get in contact with our people. Over the years, I have interviewed a number of people and or their relatives who have seen Bigfoot creatures doing something that, to many, might seem very strange. And what might it be that is so strange? Whistling, that is. On this particular issue, Bigfoot researcher Cliff Barockman, is that how you say his name? Barrickman. Barrickman, okay, sorry. Barrickman. His grandma called him Clifford. Oh. Notes, most big footer, footers have heard of De Sonoqua, the wild woman of the woods, frequently depicted on totems throughout the Northwest. She is most often shown with her lips pursed, as if whistling. Moving on to the Bigfoot Evidence blog, there is this thought-provoking, thought-provoking statement. Some believe one of the ways Sasquatch communicate is through whistling. I have a handful of such cases in my own records. One such case, and certainly from my perspective, the most interesting one, came from the family of a woman named Mabel Adams. Now, isn't that a great name for a person that saw Bigfoot? It's freaking hot is what it is. She's probably, like, very mousy, I'm thinking. <clears throat> she died many years ago, but claimed an encounter at... Rest in peace. Yes, rest in peace, Mabel. C-A-D-D-O, Cato Lake, Texas, which is a body of water I know well. So the story went, Mabel, as my my doorbell rings. Oh, dog men. Yes. Okay, as the story went, Mabel and two of her friends were playing at Cato Lake one morning in in the 1930s when they were stopped in their tracks by a terrifying whistle as her granddaughter described it to me. It was further described as very much like the kind of hoot sound associated with an owl, but which, unlike an owl, went on interrupted for about 20 seconds. At first I read that, that word and I thought it said a hot sound. I was like, wait, that can't be right. Ooh. Whistle breeches. That's my new name. Whistle breeches. Now everybody knows. Old whistle breeches. Um, the girls looked at each other, puzzled and a bit scared, but that seemed to be the end of it. Except it wasn't. A few minutes later, the same whistling was repeated. This time, though, it seemed much louder. There was a reason for this. Out of the trees came a tall creature, covered in black hair, and that resembled a gorilla. Most frightening was the strange grin that the creature had on its face. The friends fled the area, which is hardly a surprise, 
they did not see the beast again. It's worth noting that such cases are nothing new. Reports of the whistling Bigfoot date way back to the 1800s. One of the most compelling early encounters with a whistling Bigfoot occurred in February 1876, a few miles east of Warner's Ranch, California, which is located near San, San Diego County and that was and still is home to the some kind of, I don't want to ruin the name, Coop, Coopern O. American tribe. The press was told by one of the two witnesses after 10 days, oh wait, not after, about 10 days ago, Mr. Turner Helm, that's a name. Turner Helm? Turner Helm, the famous Sasquatcher, and myself were in the mountains about 10 miles east of Warner's Ranch on a prospecting tour looking for the ex extension. Go for the hills. Turner will find it. Yes. Looking for the extension of a quartz lodge, which had been found by some parties some time before. When we were separated, about half a mile apart, the wind blowing very hard at the time, Mr. Helm, who was walking along, looking down at the ground, suddenly heard someone whistle. Looking up, he saw something sitting on a large boulder, about 15 or 20 paces from him. He supposed it to be some kind of an animal, and immediately came down, or came down on it with his needle gun. What's a needle gun? I have no idea. <clears throat> the object instantly rose to its feet and proved to be a man. This man appeared to be covered all over with coarse black hair, hair seemingly two or three inches long, like the hair of a bear. His beard and the hair of his head were long and thick. He was a man of about medium size and rather fine features, not at all like those of an Indian, but more like an American or Spaniard. Um... They stood gazing at each other for a few moments. Oh. Well, wonder what song was playing. Dream Weaver. Yeah. They stood staring at each other, or gazing at each other for a few moments. Erect. Yes, they were both erect. Getting ready to Standing have a sword. Standing erect. They were getting ready to have a sword fight. <laughs> oh. When Mr. Helm spoke to the singular creature, first in English and then Spanish, and then Indian, but the man, hey man would you like a slurpee? <laughs> but the man remained silent. He then advanced towards Mr. Helm, who, not knowing what his intentions might have been, came down on him with the gun to keep him <laughs> at bay. <laughs> I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you like Lucas McCain. <laughs> that son of a bitch man pulls that rifle. I know we I feel like we talk about this every week. <laughs> but he shoots this that man rifle loves so the rifleman. People. He shoots a damn rifle so damn fast it's insane. The man at once stopped as though he knew there was danger. Mr. Helm called to me, but the wind was blowing so hard that I did not hear him. It was the wind. The wind rustling through the trees. The wild man then turned and went over the hill and just, and just soon... Wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. The wild man then turned and went over the hill and just soon out of sight. Before Mr. Helm could come to me, he had made his good escape. We had frequently before seen this man's tracks in the part of the mountains, but had supposed them to be the tracks of an Indian. I did not see this strange inhabitant of the mountains myself, but Mr. Helm is known to be a man of unquestionable veracity, and I have no doubt that the entire, of the entire truth of his statement. Are you a man of unquestionable veracity, Mr. Kyle? Absolutely not. Unquestionably not. <laughs> and that was the end of that article. That was cool. That, that was, was really cool. Watch. I could mark that off my list now. I've actually done that article because I've had it for a while. <clears throat> Heard a lot of accounts of the whistling and the whistling sound. I didn't think I did, but now thinking back on it, I think I have. But like I said before, we All right, talked about I was just going to say, like we talked about before, that samurai speak is what creeps me out. Oh, yeah. We need to, I, we need to get to see our sounds. I know. I, they're all, I think they're on digital. I feel like I should just I think it. I put it in our group. Oh, did, yeah, you did. That's right. Okay. I feel I like see if it. I can rip it out and like put it in part of the show sometime. That would be cool. 
We'll just put that in the ass. All right, well, let's hop in the Put show. that right in the show. Put it in good. Put her in there. <clears throat> we're going to have to hop in this jet, but we're going to need child seats. Actually, we're going to need cages for oh, this, God. possibly. That we sounds kind of We harsh. have those in the warehouse. It sounds harsh. We have the it's seven cages. modern cases of feral children raised in the wild. Uh, I always... Do you remember the um, book Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark? No. They were like these three books in the... I thought they were the 70s, maybe they were the early 80s. That like retold a lot of folklore for children. Ooh. And it would have like directions on how to read them aloud and stuff like that. But they always had at the back of the book a couple like reports of true cases that weren't like the folklore and stuff. And they had like something about exorcism. And one of the other ones they had was some uh, some case of feral children. Like I've always found that interesting. No, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so hit me with it. <clears throat> All right. And this is uh, from Urbo, U-R-B-O dot com. And it's, I think kids living among the animals like Tarzan did only are f- in fictional tale. Here are true cases of kids raised by wolves, monkeys, and leopards. What if they were raised by iguanas? Raised by iguanas. That's the most random animal I could think of, even though it makes no sense. Hmm. Most people think that feral children live solely in make-believe stories and myths, although they're rare, only <laughs> about 100 total cases <coughs> ever been documented. It says feral children are in fact real. And it says, by definition, a feral child is a human child who has lived away from human contact from a very young age and has little or no experience of human care, loving, or social behavior, or crucially, of human language. It says, the first and most famous case of a feral child was that of Wild Peter. He lived in That's Hanover. That's a great name. Wild Peter. It says, he lived in Hanover. Hanover, Germany was found in 1724 at the age of 12, living off plants, climbing in trees like an animal, and unable to speak. <clears throat> and this actually shows his headstone. And it says, Peter the Wild Boy, 1785, uh, maybe? And uh, feral children have been around for hundreds of years, but here are some of the most peculiar modern cases of feral children living among us and also among animals. And this is Marina Chapman. It says, the feral child story is one of the most remarkable. In 1954, at age five, Marina was kidnapped from a village in Colombia and left by her kidnappers in the jungle. She allegedly ended up befriending and living with a family of capuchin monkeys and becoming one of them. It says she claims that she ate berries and roots, slept in holes in trees, played and groomed with them, and even walked on all fours like they did. They cared for her like they were like their own, and she even tended to her when she was got a bad face case of food poisoning. She lived with the monkeys for five years, she estimates, and completely lost her language when she was discovered by hunters. <clears throat> and it says after a bis of misfortune and mistreatment Maria ended up working as a nanny in the UK she eventually married and had children her life experiences are recounted in her book the girl with no name which she wrote with her daughter I wouldn't mind reading that and here here we have Oksana Malaya and this is Oksana was born on November 1983 and was found in 1991 in Ukraine living with dogs in a kennel. Oksana's parents were negligent, alcoholic, and able to care for her. One night when she was three years old, they left her. Uh, she saved her own life by crawling into the farm kennel and keeping warm by curling up with the wild stray dogs that occupied the streets. She found a home with the dogs and learned their behaviors and mannerisms. She ran on all fours, barked and bared her teeth, panted, sniffed at her food before she ate it, and acquired acute dog-like senses of hearing, smell, and sight. <clears throat> they and took care says, of her better than her parents did. Yeah, and I I know she's been on a might have been on <clears throat> Nat Geo or something. There has been a little story about her. Oh. It says when she was discovered, Oksana only knew the words yes and no. Through intensive therapy, she was able to learn the basic and social and verbal skills of a five year old. It says now as an adult, she lives in Odessa and works with farm animals. Now, when was this? Uh, this was kind of recent here. Let me scroll back up here. 
No, she was born in 83, and she oh, was okay. found in 91. So, like, when you you said there were stories of her, did they, like, have actual footage of her? Yeah, it shows her, um, she liked to, to run around on all fours like a dog a lot. Hmm. And uh, she would kind of revert to that quite a bit. Yeah, but she would kind of talk to you, kind of like maybe a five year old. Oh, that's kind of cool. I'm gonna look that up. That's kind of cool. Yeah, if I if I could find it or think, I bet uh, my gal probably knows, remembers what episode that was. Okay, <clears throat> it might have even been a monster quest. Um, oh, okay. Where they covered some feral uh, people. I, I like that show. And uh, it, let me go back here. Where was I at? And this is, here we go to Kamala and Amala. This is in October 1920, two girls, Kamala, age 8, and Amala, age 18 months, were found in a wolf's deer den near Gaudamuri, west of Calcutta, India, by the minister of a nearby mission unit. When they were captured, the girls didn't look human, but they were physically deformed and had the characteristics of wolves. Hmm. Their tendons and joints in their arms and legs were shortened, and they had misshapen jaws, elongated canines, walked on all fours, and even had eyes that shone in the dark like a dog's eyes. Living with the humans proved hard for these girls. They often slept, curled up together, growled, ate nothing but raw meat, and howled. Like the other feral kids, they developed acute senses of hearing, sight, and smell. Unfortunately, Amala died a year after she was discovered, but Kamala survived until 17 years of age by which point she had learned to walk upright, spoke about 50 words, and started eating humans. No, that's not right. I was going to say, wait a minute. A human diet. And here we go. Here is John Sabunya. He says, John's story is a harrowing tale. In 1988, at age three, he <laughs> ran away from home when he witnessed his father murdering his mother. Oh, wow. He, he fled to the jungle and found a home living with monkeys. At six years of age, he was found by a Ugander villager and brought back to his village. In three years of living among the monkeys, he developed characteristics and traits. Did I lose you? I think my Skype cut out. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No, that's all right. I just wondered, yep. like, I heard you and then I didn't. I didn't know if... Yeah, I was talking, and, but I wouldn't hear anything. Okay. In three years of living among the monkeys, he developed ca characteristics and traits of his monkey friends. His knees were white from walking on them. His nails were long and round. He ate roots, nuts, and sweet potatoes. And he also had developed a severe case of intestinal worms. Oh, God. Ew. And he finally recalls that monkeys befriended him within two weeks in the jungle and taught him to travel with them, how to search for food, and how to climb trees. John eventually learned how to speak and proved to be a magnificent singing voice. He currently tours in the UK with the 20-member Earl of Africa's Children's Choir. That is. Isn't it amazing, though, how, like, the animals will take the children in as part of their own and, like, it, it help is. raising them? Yeah, and, and it's kind of like how interspecies will do that with other animals. Like, you see yeah. dogs nursing kittens and everything. You That's know, really it's, cool. Like, it is. I like that. Here we have Shamdeo, 1972, a four-year-old boy. He was discovered in the forest in India. He was playing with wolf cubs and even displayed the same wolf-like behaviors and characteristics as Kamala and Amala. He had long hooked fingernails, calluses on his hands and knees, sharpened teeth, and suffered from a craving for blood. We even have a picture of him here. It says he loved chicken hunting as much as he loved the darkness. He also had close friendship with dogs and jackals. He was taken to the village of Narayampur and lived among the villagers who named him Shamdeo. He never learned how to speak, <clears throat> but was able to learn sign language. He slowly weaned off raw meat and transitioned into a more human diet. In 1978, he entered Mother Teresa's home for the destitute and dying in Lucknow, where he was renamed Pascal and was visited by the English travel writer and novelist Bruce Chatwin. He died in 1985. Now we have Prava, the bird boy. 2008, a seven-year-old boy named Prava was found and rescued by Russian healthcare workers. He was living in a tiny two-bedroom apartment with his 31-year-old mother and dozens of birds. But that smelled good. Oof. Oh my God, can you imagine? His mother, suffering from mental illness, illness, neglected him by treating him like not a child, but one of the birds. So she didn't physically harm him or leave him without food. She just never spoke to him. He was confined to the room with the bird cages, and bird feed, and droppings. His only friends and companions were birds. As a result, he never learned to speak. Only 
only chirp. That's not funny. That's no, that's so awful, funny. though, that she treated him like that. Horrible. It says when he was misunderstood, he would have to wave his... <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> Damn, Skype keeps cutting out. He would wave his hands and arms like birds do with their wings. Tweet, tweet. Eventually, his mother released him to the state, and he was moved to a psychological care facility where he remains today. Doctors continue to uh, rehabilitate him. God bless him. Yeah. In Less is Leopard Boy, in 1912, a two-year-old boy was stolen from his parents by a leopardess near Assam, south of the Himalayan mountains. Three years later, he was found by a hunter living with the leopard mother and her children. When he was found, he displayed all the characteristics of a leopard. He ran on all fours. It's reported that he could run on all fours as fast as an adult man. His knees and palms had hard calluses. His toes were upright, almost right angles with his instep. And his hands, toes, and thumbs were covered in tough skin. Human contact was problematic anyone or anything that came up or near him was bitten and torn up. He could not only speak, only grunt and growl. Fortunately, he was able to assimilate back into human society and later learn to speak and walk more upright. And that is our story. Those are good. I mean, modern. I've always been fascinated by that. But those are good. Modern, yep. And it, I, th I think there's probably more feral humans out there than we know about. Oh, there's definitely there's some. There's yeah. probably a, many that haven't been found. Right. Let's see. Where do I want to go? <clears throat> All right. Um, where are you taking us? We're going to go with the military and talk about some military encounters with international... International? Dear God, I can't read. Military encounters with supernatural entities. Ooh. Of the demonic variety. Sounds interesting. This is from Mysterious Universe, and it is written by Brent Swanser. This could be a long one, because these articles usually are. That's what she said. Yes. War brings... War, ugh, let me try that again. War brings with it violence, horror, strife, and madness. Among all of the chaos and bloodshed, there could be some very strange occurrences indeed. And across the ages, there have been various accounts of something very strange going on behind the scenes of our relentless drive to kill ourselves. Although there are plenty of reports of the killing and death of war, what is not often reported upon the are the numerous cases. Oh my God! What is often not reported upon are the numerous cases of strange sightings and phenomena that seem to be going on as well. Perhaps some of the more bizarre of these are the baffling entities that have been seen in the wartime of sinister beasts with a decidedly supernatural, perhaps even demonic nature. Here is a selection of wartime encounters with creatures and beings that seem to be lie beyond the current, our current understanding of the world as we know it. One rather obscure but terrifying encounter occurred in October of 1943 among the cacophony of death and chaos of the German bombings of London. As the citizens cowered in their homes, fearfully awaiting the next bombing, a military group called the ARP, I guess that, oh, I was thinking of AARP, never mind that joke, joke wouldn't work. The air raid precautions stalked through the streets, painted by flickering, painted by the flickering of the glows of explosions and picked through the rubble of the massacre, in an effort to salvage as many lives as they could. One of these men was named Howard Leland, and he was to find something perhaps far worse than any enemy in the war-turned wasteland. At, the point of the gr <clears throat> At some point, the ground heaved with the wrath of a particularly close bomb strike, and Leland allegedly ducked into a quaking abandoned house to take shelter as the structure rained down and the debris rained down upon him. As it was night, he used his flashlight to pierce through the veil, um, getting re or passing through the dust particles dislodged by the bomb strike that were hovering and dancing in the beam. He made his way to the top of a darkened stairwell that descended down into a wretched black that his feeble light could not shake off. 
and he nevertheless stumbled down to the bottom of the stairs, where he reportedly crouched down to wait out the enemy bombing run, praying that the building he was in would not be the next to be disintegrated. Um, there's a picture of it, apparently. As he waited there for either the bombs to stop or to die, he purportedly began to get the very strong feeling that he was being watched, that eyes were laying heavily upon him, a feeling that would evolve into a palpable sense of thick dread. Sitting there in the dark silence, Leland reportedly shone his flashlight up to the top of the stairs and caught in its beam the horrific sighting of what looked like a massive cat-like beast crouching on the top step, with large incandescent eyes and horns protruding from its head. I'm sure neither of your cats have horns protruding from their head. Oh, I think they just might. They just haven't looked close enough sometimes. Oh, you, th you think they hide them from you? When they're chucking boxes down my upstairs steps at 2 a.m., I think they have horns. They're evil. Oh, are they well rowdy? Little... Are they rowdy at night? Cryptid cats, yes. My God, yes. It's like WrestleMania. Yeah, cats always get crazy. Slamming night, they each say. other. They're sweet babies. Yeah. Leland, Leland would later explain that the monstrous entity had seemed to exude icy waves of an aura of evil, and that its unblinking eyes had had a hypnotic quality that held him in a trance. Do your cats ever hide you, held, hold you in a trance? All the time. <clears throat> so they're very similar to this. As he sat there, transfixed by the entity's gaze, it suddenly leapt from the step to come pouncing down towards him as an unearthly howl reverberated through the air. Yet before it hit the ground, it seemed to evaporate into thin air, breaking him from whatever spell it had kept him in. At the same moment, at the same moment, he said that he had heard human voices and footsteps, and that some of his fellow ARP members had then emerged from the floor or from the gloom to his rescue. Leland told them what had happened in a panic, but none of the other men reported having seen anything strange in the house and had not heard the bone-chilling wail he described. However, much to Leland's surprise, some of the other men in the unit claimed that a very similar shadowy cat-like beast with horns and fangs and glowing eyes had been spotted by others in the same vicinity. Apparently, Leland would be the, so disturbed by his harrowing encounter with the unexplained that he would visit a clairvoyant named John Pendragon. Now, that's, that sounds like a cool name. Yeah, he needs to do something like, yeah. Pendragon. Who was allegedly it... immediately able to a divine to divine the location of the house on a map of London. With some digging into the history of the house, it would turn out that one of the previous owners had been an occultist and black magician who had routinely used cats for sacrifices in dark arcane rituals. Fuck him. Yeah, fuck him. It seems that this sinister individual had gone mad and then hung himself at the top of the stairs after which the cat monster had been spotted over the years. This caused Pendragon to come back or come to the conclusion that the entity Leland had seen was perhaps some sort of elemental spirit or demon that had taken on a feline form due to absorbing the history of cat violence that permeated the structure. The account was written of in both Pendragon's autobiography, which is called simply Pendragon, as well as Brad Steiger's book, Bizarre Cats, and remains a truly bizarre account of the unexplained from World War II. It seems like a lot of these entities that people see are not corporeal, like they just vanish. They're not, they don't have any substance to them. They're all just images. Might lend something to the interdimensional. Yeah, that makes sense. Like argument, they just you know? zip back to wherever they're, gonna, wherever they're from. Mm-hmm. Another type of vaguely demonic World War II entity, supposedly seen during World War II, was devilish-looking little beasts known as gremlins. And I immediately think of the gremlin thing, da 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 the music <laughs> of the movie. Yeah, yeah. These gnome-like, 
somewhat reptilian creatures were often reported especially by pilots during the war on all sides of the conflict and were often blamed for technical mishaps, malfunctions, and freak accidents. I have covered this here at Mysterious Universe before, and a par partially strange example of such an account comes from a man identified only as L.W. Now that name reminds me of that guy we had on on the first the first incarnation of the show that was um, visited by the Mantoids. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I wonder forget if his it, name, but it was uh, like it was some W. Yeah, it was initials. Was it QW? QW. Yeah. He was mm. a Boeing 217 pilot during the war, and not only believes that many plane failures were due to the activities of these mischievous creatures, but also claims to have had a close encounter of his own with the creatures. L.W. claimed that during one mission, his aircraft had sudden technical difficulties, and that when he investigated, he came face to face with the legendary gremlins, which he said were about three feet tall with hairless gray skin, long pointy ears, and red eyes. Now, is that what the gremlins in the movie look like? Kind of. They're green. They don't have red eyes. Okay. They're kind of slimy. He would Sweaty. say he would say of what happened thus. So I am very rare, aware of my surroundings, and as I go higher, I notice an unusual sound coming from the engine. The instruments went nuts. I looked at my right, and I see an entity staring at me. Then I look at the aircraft's nose, and there it is, another one, hanging in there. <clears throat> Dancing lizards. I was perfectly fine. My senses were in good shape. But the weird things were still there looking at me. They kept going at it, pounding. <laughs> I don't know why that cracked me up. Oh, they wow. Kept going... <laughs> yeah. They kept going at it. They didn't pounding even care that I was watching. Pounding As the plane. As a matter of fact, I think they liked it. Pound... <laughs> I, I began to like it. <laughs> Pounding the plane with all their might. They appeared to be laughing with their big Pounce. mouths open. What's that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not going to interrupt you. No. What would you say? I said he pounds it. Pound that metal. That's what he does. They appeared to be laughing with their big mouths open, looking <laughs> at me. <laughs> Hitting the plane with their long arms, trying to pull stuff. I have no doubt in my mind that they were trying to crash it. I managed to stabilize the flight. And I saw the creatures falling, falling, falling off the aircraft. I don't know if they fell and died or if they jumped from my plane to a different one. I have no idea. There are numerous similar reports from throughout World War II. And whether these creatures were ever real at all or just the product of addled minds, they remain at least curious accounts of something decidedly supernatural in nature during World War II. I feel like there were too many accounts for them to be all in people's minds. The the gremlin accounts are always really fascinating. You know, you you've got the yeah. classic Twilight Zone episode, right? Know, yep. And in the movie, and and the, so maybe there's some basis to that legend, like most legends, you know. So was that an episode just in the movie, or was it an episode by itself? It was an ep original episode with William Shatner. Of all was he in the movie too? No, in the movie it was John Lithgow. Which I oh, thought okay. was brilliant. It was awesome. The Grimman looked really creepy in the movie. In that Twilight Zone, the movie. In later years, we have a case of very demonic creatures supposedly encountered during the Vietnam War, which was 1955 to 1975. I didn't realize that year was that war was 20 years old. I guess when they sent in the uh, uh, advisors, I guess that counts. Uh, too. Yeah. Wow, I didn't either. Now that you say that, which re was related relayed to Lon Strickler at the site Phantoms and Monsters, someone else I'd love to talk to, by a witness who claims to have been a U.S. Army corporal during the war. He claims that in 1970 he was second in command of a squad of soldiers operating in a thickland jungle remote area just south of the DMZ, which is the demilitarized zone. Um, soldiers at the demilit demilitarized zone. Do, oh, I'm just. If anybody ever hears me re read strange things, I start. I think it's the text, but I start reading the picture captions. So if you hear me like start reading and stopping, that's why. Like I can't tell that they're captions from a picture. 
It's not the crystal meth, I'll be promise. No, my teeth are falling out because of that. For sale on Crypto Files Facebook yeah. group. It's Signed. Not. The witness claims that they have they had set up a Biverac. B I V E R A C. Biverac. What is that? I think it's like a tent. Oh. We're supposed we're supposed to know this because we're crypto guys. I mean, yes, it's for for oh, it's a tent. Yes, for research. In an area of steep hills, and had then set out on a night patrol of the surrounding vicinity. They encountered what they took to be enemy activity and hunkered down to wait it out, during which time they got only fleeting glimpses of something moving through the brush. When the activity died down, they continued through the valley they were in until they hit a sheer wall of stone that only looked as if someone had stacked ominous boulders in front of it. A cave entrance was also visible, which looked to have been cleanly carved into solid rock. It was very unlike anything they knew of enemy caves, and they decided to get closer to investigate. That's never good. Like, never go inside a cave that you don't know what's in there, because it's always creepy stuff. And wear a condom. Uh, yeah, that too. As they approached, as they approached, a fetid, putrid smell, like rotting eggs and human decay, began to pervade the area. Not a good sign. Yeah. What seemed to be bellowing out from the cave opening. On a first date. That's a first date I would run away from. Especially if the person has a cave opening. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, oh. So bad was the stench that several squad <laughs> members... What? Oh, I'm sorry. Nothing. Go ahead. <laughs> so bad was the stench that several squad members reportedly fell physically ill, vomiting in the, in the bushes. <laughs> They took up positions in the jungle near the entrance and waited as as they discerned discerned strange rumbling sounds from below. As dawn began to come, something very strange happened indeed, which one of the witnesses says, But then we noticed movement in front of the cave. A being, I first thought it was a man, moved through the entrance into the clearing in front of the cave. As it stood up from a crouch, it stood at least seven feet high, and started to look in our direction. At that time, another similar-looking creature was moving out of the cave. They were making hellish hissing sounds and looked directly at us. Reptilians? That's what my first thought. Most likely. <clears throat> the only way I can describe these beings is that they look like up- oh, upright lizards. Oh, reptilians. Yep. The scaly, shiny skin was very dark, almost black. Snake-like faces with forward-set eyes that were very large. They had arms and legs. What? Makes me want to watch V. I've never watched V. I need to watch V. Oh, you need to watch the original. We need to talk. Yeah. Snake people, reptilians. Was it a miniseries or a TV show? I never figured that out. It was a miniseries, my friend. Okay. Your life might depend on you seeing this. Okay. I'll try to find it. They had arms and legs like a human but with scaly skin. I didn't notice a tail, though they wore long one-piece dark green robes, along with, a dark, <laughs> along with a dark cape-like covering on their heads. <clears throat> I never noticed if they had anything on their feet. Well, they obviously wore moccasins, probably, or like Skechers or something, or Uggs. Mm. What if they wore no. Uggs? Wouldn't it be ironic if they wore like lizard skin boots? That would be awesome. Um, I lost my spot. Hold on a second. Okay. No one gave the order. It seemed like the entire squad opened fire at once. Every piece of vegetation between us and them was quickly sheared away. I yelled out a ceasefire order. At the same time, I was looking in the direction of the cave. There was nothing there. We immediately checked our flank in case these things circled around us, but there was nothing. As we approached the cave, ready to resume action if needed, it became apparent that the beings had escaped, most likely back into the cave. It was soon decided to set charges and close the cave entrance. So the caves went boom. When we returned to camp, we all seemed to be in a daze. There was little discussion of the incident, and we were never debriefed. 
So I know the sergeant never filed a report. Then again, if he did, it was kept quiet by the brass. It is a very strange account to be sure, if it is true at all. Moving on into later years, yet there are more reports of U.S. military personnel stationed at Hahn Air Base at Morbach, Germany, during the Cold War in the 1980s. According to soldiers at the base, a strange wolf-like creature loping about on two legs was spotted from time to time, with one particularly harrowing account coming from 1988. According to the report, <clears throat> one evening, a group of Air Force personnel were at the base when the sirens began shrieking into the dark, indicating that something had tripped an alarm somewhere. Base personnel went to investigate and apparently came across a bipedal wolf-like monstrosity standing around eight or nine feet in height, which gazed menacingly at the soldiers before clearing a ten-foot fence with apparent ease. When a tracker dog was brought in, it apparently became overwhelmed with fear at the sight of the sighting, cowering and trembling with terror. <clears throat> at the time, it seemed that no one knew of a persistent legend in the area of a creature that spans time or spans from the time of Napoleon. According to the tales, a man named Johannes Baptiste Schweitzer and some other had designed Napoleon's army deserted his army and fled towards his homeland in in Alscase. Let me take it one second here. Yeah, I guess it's Alscase. Eventually finding himself in the German town of Whitlick, where they murdered the family of a farmer whose land had been stolen from. The legend says that the farmer's wife cursed 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 Schweitzer to become a howling beast on the full moon after which the soldier had killed her as well. The stories say that the curse worked, and that he became a beast at the full moon, to murder, rape, and pillage as a bipedal wolf-like abomination, continuing his reign until he was killed by a lynch mob of villagers. Why has he got a rape? Why yeah, can't he be a rapey werewolf? Why not just murder? Why be a rapist? Rapey werewolf. It is speculated that this legend may have had something to do with what the U.S. personnel saw and an anthropologist from the College of Mainz by the name of Matthias Burgard even checked out these reports to uncover s several reports of a bipedal wolf-like man in the area. What was, go <laughs> what was going on here? No one seems to really know. And... Tales of the more back monster, monster continue to circulate. Coming into the 2000s, we have the war in Afghanistan, which produced some strange accounts as well. One that was personally relayed to me was that of a man named Jerry Alberdeen, who in, in 2004 was stationed in Mosul. He told a very strange story of a seemingly demonic creature encountered out in the Badlands. He would say of this word in weird incident thus, I was attached to 2-3 Infantry 3 SB, SBCT at FOB Patriot. A call went out on the radio that FOB Diamondback, the airfield, was under attack. Everyone from FOB Courage jumped into the closest vehicles and headed to the airfield to counter the attack. I was in a vehicle with some other infantry guys, an engineer, and a psyops guy. When we got to the airfield, we saw several dudes trying to climb over the wall. <clears throat> the gunner opened up on them, and the rest of us took up a position in a ditch on the other side of the road and opened fire. There were three of us side by side, the engineer, the psyops guy, and myself. We, f we fired at one, guy, at one guy, and he dropped from the top of the wall Hard to tell who actually shot him. Right after he fell, there were was streams of black smoke coming off of him. The engineer made the comment that he must have been wearing a suicide vest, and it malfunctioned. A few seconds later, the black smoke grew larger and started to take a human-looking shape. What happened next, all three of us saw, and there was no doubt. 
The now fully materialized black smoke was standing upright and now had red, smoky, glowing eyes and a weird-looking mouth. The damn thing actually smiled at us and turned to sort of run, but it was dissipated after it took a few steps. Very hard to describe how it all happened. All three of us just looked at each other, wide-eyed, for a second or two. After it was all over, we only spoke about this once, and never again after that. So I wonder what that was. Mm, I'm not sure. Was this a demon, a ghost, a specter, or what? It is hard to say. There are also reports of what seems to be actual vampires in Afghanistan, and I've written of these here before. One investigator, reporter, and former U.S. Marine named Tim King, who spent several months in the Afghanistan combat theater covering a variety of military operations for SalemNews.com and Oregon's KPTV Fox 12, wrote of such a thing in the 2007 article entitled Vampires in Afghanistan. Soldiers say it's true. According to King, during his travels, he met an American soldier at the Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, who would tell him a bizarre tale indeed. The soldier asked King if he knew about the vampire problem in the area, something the reporter had not once heard of in his entire time in the country. Intrigued, King asked for more information on what the soldier was talking about, who obliged by claiming that the vampires were said to live deep in the desert, that they were quite a bit taller than normal humans, <clears throat> and that they were frequently women. Oh, tall women, man. What, what would you do with that situation? Burrow down in the sand and hide. That makes perfect sense. He claimed the people of the area had known about these sinister creatures for centuries, that they came out in the dark and stalked the desert badlands and mountains at night, looking for victims, and they were, that they were indeed often thought to be responsible for people going missing without a trace. The soldier would tell King... They are really terrified of them. It scares people half to death if they just think one is around. They come out at night. Sometimes people go missing, especially kids. They even pull these animals inside when the vampires are out. It's been going on for hundreds of years here. People in other parts of the world don't even know about it. But anyone who has lived around here does. Guys are scared. You're damn right. They know there isn't a thing anyone can do about it. If one of them decides to come at you, you just stick with the other people and hope for the best sometimes. War brings out monsters, and with that there can be no doubt. Yet among the human monsters that congeal out of the darkness of conflict also seem to be those of a rather uncertain origin. Are these the results of stressed minds plagued by the specters of war? Are they just tall tales and superstitions? Or are these perhaps a peek into the world of the, world of the strange entities prowling the f fringes of the suffering we bring upon ourselves, perhaps feeding upon the terror of it all? They're often the cracks of all of the report. Wait, what? They're within the cracks of all of the reports of war. We continue to uncover such anonymous cases and warnings. Just what does it all mean? I figured that'd be a long article, but most of those were pretty interesting, I thought. Yeah, that last one was super fascinating. Yeah, I'd like to know more about the vampires of that area, what people, you know, believe and think. Oh, yeah, I wonder if it would tie into, like, the gin, you know. It might, because that's a, the same area, right, I would think? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I See, I it's so alien to me, like, I know nothing about it, that makes it even more creepy, like, that whole area, you know. Yeah, we'll have to do some gin stuff sometime. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you well, have I've anything? Got, anything I've got a cryptid for us. I've got okay. something we haven't talked about before. Okay. Bring and it on me. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to hop in the in the jet. We're going all the way to Madagascar. Do you know how much money we I wonder how much money we spend on fuel. I don't know. It's I just right, keep we charging it. it. We haven't paid paid it yet. It doesn't matter. It's just money. It doesn't matter. We have those big time benefactors too that we oh. you know, can never name. There are millions of listeners across the globe. Shit. Other planets. Yes. And this is we're in Madagascar. And this is the Kalinaro or Kalinoro. K A L A N Oro. 
and it said, is a humanoid cryptid said to live deep inside Madagascar. It is claimed these creatures can be found throughout Madagascar, yet encounters with the Kalinoro are very rare. Other tribes in, in other areas of the island agree the Kalinoro exists, but they call them by different names, such as the Kataki or the Vazimba. And the Antakarana and the Tesamehiti peoples claim that the Kalinoro in their region mostly dwells in caverns. We have more cave dwellers here, Jesse. I think my mo- my least favorite thing as part of this show is like having to pronounce these names. Yeah, we get some names. Yeah, so according to the people of Madagascar, the Kalinoro have been on the island for more than 2,000 years. When people migrated to the island is when the first encounters occurred. Let's, want a description of these things? It yes, said it's I would like one. generally described as a humanoid with hooked fingers and three backward-facing toes. They also have long fingernails, spines, and long hair. The Kalinoro is also said to be no more than two feet high. They eat raw seafood, vegetables, and grains. Some kinds of grains. Oh, so they go after the sushi then. Yep. Yeah. So the Kalinoro are known to abduct children and search Madagascar's villages for food. So most of the Kalinoro are said to have great magical powers. The Kalinoro's long hair endows them with supernatural strength. Supposedly their powers are transferable. For some, and it says Moses, or herbalists, in Madagascar claim that potions of magical powders impregnated with ground Kalinoro hair provides the user with great mystical powers. Madagascar Moises also act as mediums. Many work with the spirits of the Kalinoro, who they claim to have great healing powers. The Kalinoro are thought to be spirits of nature. Those who seek the Kalinoro mediums do so because they think they have become cursed inadvertently by trespassing into the region that is sacred to the Kalinoro. We got some sightings here. It's got an awesome picture of this little dude. And to me, this looks kind of like a like a chupacabra a little bit. Yeah, it does. And it's a, according to the Travel Africa magazine, Aloy saw his first Kalinoro on a rice paddy behind his village and it describes it as a little man less than a meter tall with hair all over his body and long fingernails. They can apparently be lured by the irresistible smell of frying pistachio nuts. But oh, it tends... that, would, that would get all, everybody. I mean, the I smell that... p- pistachio You like nuts. fried pistachio? Is that, a, is that a Latrobe thing? Not that I know of. It sounds like something you guys would have. It does sound like something we'd have, doesn't it? <clears throat> get your fried pistachio nuts here! Get your fried nuts! It's like a Kennedy. Said, but attempts to catch them are usually unsuccessful because their feet point backwards and hunters inever- inever- inevitably track them in the wrong direction. That's awesome. Oh, it's 1889. Went the wrong way again, Clyde. <laughs> that son of a bitch. In 1889. I don't know, when I, do, I don't know when I do these jokes why I always use the name Clyde. Clyde must have been another life. Clyde must have been, been very... Okay. In 1889, however, a capture was reported by the Royal Geographical Society. And that sounds important, so it's probably true. And it says, yeah. and in 1924, Chase Salmon Osborne described a Kalinoro sighting that he Wait, assumed... Wait, what was his name? Chase Salmon Osborne. I thought you said Salmon. I just wanted to double salmon. check. Salmon. So described a Kalinoro sighting that he assumed must have been a honeymoon couple because they were... Making love by a campfire. Oh, oh yeah. He said, despite it doesn't have a position or anything. It says, despite their human traits and telepathic abilities, are considered animals. And it says the Kalinoro did join in with the. No, it didn't say that. <clears throat> and it says in a 1964 article, the author Basil Pertley asserted that the Kalinoro were dwarfish creatures. He compared them to the European legend of elves and trolls that stole food and replaced human with their own children and generally caused mischief and mayhem. That'd be funny, you get up and one of these things are... <laughs> like you go in the... child's room on I mean, Christmas That's not day. funny. But don't, don't be swapping. And it's fucking replaced with one of these things. They'll never know. The natives of Madagascar roundly reject that description. Professor Joe Hobbs if his name was Joe Hobbit, it would be so perfect. That would be his amazing. Name was, his name was Joe Hobbs. Hi, I'm Professor Joe Hobbit, see? Of 
The University of Missouri Columbia's Department of Geography studied them. Okay, you're from was... Missouri, right? Yes, sir. I've heard people pronounce it. Is it? Do you guys pronounce it Missouri or Missouri? We're Missouri people. There's there's folks who say Missouri. Or I feel like it ends in an I, so it has to be Missouri. We say Missouri. Okay. Some people say Missouri. Are you Pennsylvania E or Pennsylvania A? Uh? Pennsylvania A. Uh. Frankenstein. That's right. Professor Joe Hobbs. Funny. That movie's funny as hell. Yes, it is. Professor Joe Hobbs of the University of Missouri, Columbia's Department of Geography, studied them while he was okay. He, while he was in the local tribes in the Arkansas, or Arkansas, Kara <laughs> <laughs> and Karana Special Reserve. That'd be awesome. Is Arkansas. Madagascar on May fifteenth, two thousand. When Hobbs wrote his report, he said Calvin. No, there was no Calvin. He talked of how the people in the village of the Amabakaladi considered the Anadabura Cave sacred because of three separate occasions. Most recently, just two years ago, grief-stricken parents of whose children had wandered up into the forest and recovered them alive here. It says, after food was left out for the Kalinoro in exchange, in exchange for the creatures or for the children's return. And it says, in 2006, at Cryptomungo, Cryptomundo, I'm so sorry. Cryptomundo, Lauren Coleman, was a, kind of a badass in cryptozoology. Very famous also. man. I'd love to go to his, I always, I follow him on Twitter. I'd love to go to his uh, crypto museum in Maine. You should, you'll give me a bumper sticker if you go. Okay. <clears throat> and it says. I'll take crypto, well the plane's crypto one, I'll take the crypto mobile. There you go. It says, he reported that a U.S. Navy SEAL unit encountered a, group of strange apes in the Democratic Republic of, Republic of Congo. Recorded, according to Lauren, the information came from a reliable source and fit in with the area's history of weird cryptids. The drawing by Harry Trumbor was illustrated for the book The Field Guide to Bigfoot by Lauren Coleman and Patrick Hugh and depicted the Kalinoro, a short three-toed bipedal water-dwelling mean, scruffy-haired humanoid. They said mean, I didn't. It's apparently known to the tribes of Madagascar from the blog post. And it says, I've learned through a confidential source that at least one unit of the U.S. Navy SEAL has a remarkable recent encounter with the unknown apes in Africa. And a video was taken. We are seeking additional information and other eyewitnesses. Have any accounts of history came your way? And it says... What the former SEAL relates is that he was involved in covert operations in the Democratic Republic of Congo between 1997 and 2002. It said, according to his account, his team observed a group of 13 chimpanzee-like creatures between four and a half to five foot tall, uniformly gray all over their bodies, with rows of seemingly porcupine-like quills running the length of their backs. Oh, wow. And it said the unidentified apes walked by pit Italy and were observed by the SEAL team in the act of killing another animal. When the creatures became excited or agitated, the quills or spines stood erect from their bodies. According to this informant, the U.S. Navy SEAL team took three minutes of video footage of these creatures, but this tape apparently has been classified. Of course. It says all the tribes on the island of Madagascar, located off the east coast of Africa, know of the Kalinoro, according to the folklorist, Raymond DeCary, who researched the common themes connecting these stories of the Kalinoru back in the 1950s. In 1889, a capture of a Kalinoru was reported to the Royal Geographical Society. In 1924, Chase Salmon Osborne again described his sighting of two Kalinoru mating. That's not here. We'd have to look farther for that. We don't have that. If you no, we don't, we don't have information. If you want to get the, the salacious accounts, you can go to this article and then and they go on, you know, find your dirty stuff. That's kind of a cool, fascinating account. I've never, I've never heard of that before. You know, it kind of sounded like the Orang Pendek, maybe for a, for a minute, you know, a smaller yeah, um, you know, creature. But then the spines that stick up, that is fascinating. I'm surprised we haven't heard more about this. I think Josh Gates might have done this on his show. Uh, Destination forget. Truth, is it? Oh yeah, no! I think destination unknown. I always get to the that's a destination, destination, destination unknown. Yeah. yeah. All right. So in the last show, we did two short stories from two articles I have. One is something like nineteen stories to keep you up at night, and the other one is ten tales of children's nightmares. So we're gonna do those now, 
and this one is called Hitting the Ground. I was on vacation in Ithaca with my boyfriend at the time. We had literally, we had literally, I'm talking 10 minutes, just gotten into town and stopped at a suspension bridge near Cornell's campus. I'm terrified of heights, and so my boyfriend was coaxing me step by step over the bridge. It was gorgeous, and we stopped at the middle to take a picture. Now, if you're, co if you're being coaxed step by step, you wouldn't think you'd want to waste any time at all to take a picture. Dude's trying to get some sweet, sweet loving. Yeah, I think so. Simply coaxing her. Come on, man. On the side we have come, had come from, there was a parking lot with steps leading to the bottom of the gorge. But on the far side, there were hiking paths with no barriers. A woman, a woman walked past. God, a woman walked past us, and offered to take a picture of us. We declined, and she smiled and walked quickly to the far side of the bridge, where she smoothly jumped off into the gorge. There was not a second of hesitation. It was almost like she expected the path to keep going. The sound of the per of a person hitting the ground from a jump like that sticks with you. I did not expect that. Man, I. <clears throat> That's really gross. You know, I sent somebody forwarded forwarded it to me, and uh, it was somebody. I thought they were bungee jumping, mm -hmm. but they jumped from a tower and they splatted. I mean, they hit the ground. I guess it was a suicide, and it showed what the body looked like. Oh, oh my god. gosh! Who sent that? A big to apology you? if you're listening to me and I sent that to you. I'm sorry. I thought somebody was bungee jumping, but That's it's really cool. horrific. Like when a body, like what the face looks like and. The bones, like, compound fractures sticking out. It was really oh, horrendous. Oh, nasty. Oh, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. So, just so everybody knows, um, I did say it was over my cold, and I am, but as usual, at nights, I sound like ass. <laughs> so. No, you sound all right, buddy. All right. Uh, next up from the Childhood Nightmares article is, this sounds like, it could be the perils of Pennsylvania if I lived here. Mortifying Massachusetts. Um, okay. I grew up mostly in New England. More specifically, Massachusetts. Although I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. My earliest memory is from when I was very young. No older than three. I am 25 now. So it seems impossible to have a memory that long ago. But I remember being terrified of a figure in the bathroom. And the face resembling the tragedy mask, a white frown mask. I know it is very vague, but I remember my parents being in another room playing a board game and then coming in to find nothing. My second experience, I was probably four to six years old. My grandparents on my mother's side had a cottage on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. The town was called Dennis. I do not remember this firsthand, but I was with my aunt who at the time was probably in her late teens. She is the person who spiked my interest in the paranormal and all, always said her and I had a connection. We were in the living room soaking our feet in hot water because we had both gotten splinters on the same, on the same toe on the same foot. We were alone in the house and according to her, I kept pointing to the kitchen and asking who the man was. She checked and there was no man there. This happened several times, but nothing ever happened beyond that, and no man made an appearance to her. In this same house, my grandfather said he saw a woman standing outside his window and two children playing jumping rope. The neighbors also reported to us several times that while we were out, of the, out, while we were out the lights would turn on and off. I'm not sure, but given the area where the house was located, it is probably very old. My grandparents shortly after sold the house, and I have never been back since. So I guess you should look out for men and our black figures in tragedy masks. That'd be kind of a creepy presence to walk up on or to see at night. What it, have you ever like heard of the tragedy mask? Yeah, it's a kind of a classic. The comedy and tragedy. One's happy and one's sad. Oh, okay. That, I don't know how far that get. That might go back to even like Greek or something. It pr you know what? It probably does. That far back, I'm not sure, but but the, it would be really creepy. I kind of think of the Motley Crue album, um, Theater of Pain, and there's a comedy and tragedy mask on it with a pentagram on the tragedy. Oh, I was like, oh that's okay. creepy. That's what I was thinking of when you were saying that. So 
<clears throat> I know we're on different time zones and everything, but as yes. we're sitting here now, happy Easter, buddy. Happy Easter, buddy. Happy Easter to you and your family and to all our listeners. I hope everybody happy has Easter. a crypto Easter. We're supposed to get three inches of snow. That's insane in April. Like the first oh. day of April. Yeah, I got to do quite a bit of driving, so I'm like, ah, it sucks. Oh, that's right. You go into the in-laws? Yes. Well, maybe you could download the latest Horacopia. <laughs> I could. I'm not sure my gal would even listen. She's or, just not a podcast listener. Yeah, so. or just listen to killer I music. Cry. Yeah, even then. It's yeah. silent trips, my friend. You guys pretty much agree on music, though, right? I thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty good, yeah. Well, that's good. <clears throat> so, what do you got for us? I have. Is it is it time for the... Uh, for the perils. I think it is time. Oh, I've got one for you, buddy. Oh, shit. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know how these got there, but it's two people spot a thylacine-like creature oh. in Pennsylvania. Wow. That's amazing to me. Like, how did they get there? Yes. The Australian cryptid. Uh, I don't think it's... I, the Tasmanian tiger, I don't think it's extinct. There's a lot of uh, I don't think it is. There's a lot of evidence that says In Tasmania, out. I believe there's been some... So, this is Exton, Pennsylvania. You know where Exton is? I've heard of it, but I'm not exactly sure where it's at. And it says, a man in southeast Pennsylvania says he saw a creature that resembled a Tasmanian tiger and part hyena. <clears throat> it says, Christopher Connor, a 34-year-old audio engineer and videographer, told Cryptozoology News on Monday that they were driving north, or driving on 202 North, in late April, when they came across the ident- unidentified animal, it says, We saw this thing dart across the road as we were merging from one highway to another. It ran directly in front of my vehicle, he said. It wasn't exactly lightning fast, as it was care- careful not to hit it. <clears throat> it was fast enough to start from the left and cross all the way over before I passed it, he added. Connor described it as a young, canine like creature with very tall legs <clears throat> and the four legged animal he said exhibited patches of different colored hair it says my girlfriend made a joke that it looked like a like camo shorts i had just purchased you could tell it was young whatever it was and it, it would grow larger i swear the first thing i thought of that it bared any resemblance to was a tasmanian tiger but of course i knew that it wasn't that so i just looked at a thylacine picture also and the creature that i saw was taller on its limbs but the body was very similar my girlfriend was with me at the time and said yesterday she still has a picture of it in her head, and it didn't look like any canine, canine or feline she she had ever seen. She thought it looked like part hyena, and I agree with that. And it says the Pennsylvania man says he is sure it wasn't a dog or a cat, and it definitely wasn't a raccoon. He says I've read about coy wolves being in the area in northwest Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia. I wouldn't completely rule it out. It could have been one of those, but I've never seen one, and I kind of have a feeling it wasn't. This was like nothing I'd ever seen. It says, in March 2016, a man in Tennessee claimed to have seen a Tasmanian tiger on Interstate 75. <clears throat> and it says, the thylacine, commonly known as the Tasmanian tiger, was the largest carnivorous marsupial known to date. Native to Australia, New Guinea, and Tasmania, the thylacine became extinct in the 20th century, mainly due to human indiscriminate action. Reports of sightings from these areas surface frequently, but with lack of evidence, suggest animal misidentification. And it said it is not common for a similar sighting to be reported in the American continent. And we've got a picture of just the uh, Tasmanian tiger. So I think those are very real. Yeah, I think that um, they're definitely, we're, they're seeing a lot in, in uh, you know, Australia now. There's been a lot of sightings, and hopefully, you know, hopefully they're, they're not extinct, but I, I've there's been a lot of accounts of something kind of like that. I think people have seen too the, many, there's too many accounts North, people have seen you know, too many things for them to say I mean I know they, they, running they around the evidence, out there. But I don't think they're extinct. And this was interesting because he said it, it it didn't look like it was full grown yet like it was still going to grow. Yeah. So you better watch your back out there buddy. I have so many things to worry about here. It's a good thing you have the, the cryptid crew there to take care of you keep you safe. Yeah I don't know where. You could possibly capture one of these you know. Could you imagine if I did? Be awesome. If I like randomly texted you on like a Tuesday and I was like, "Dude, you're not gonna believe me, but I captured a thylacine." We're getting a 
We're getting a van. We're going to tour the United States and show it. The Crypto Menagerie. World's greatest thylacine hunter, Jesse. That's right. So, again, everybody, I apologize for the voice kind of crapping out at times, but hope you enjoyed the episode. I think we had some really good stories this week. Yeah, I think that was a good one, yeah, for sure. Um, do we have any shout-outs? Uh, just everybody in the Facebook group, and I cut you off last episode. I feel horrible for you were giving a shout-out to Billy Ray Capricorn, uh, who joined our group, and I'm sorry, Marshall, I cut him off. My bad. You can scream at me. But shout out to everybody in there who post and talk. And we love interaction. Yeah, Do thanks everybody for joining. And as we've said before, if you've had a cryptid encounter or any paranormal encounter, you can feel free to post it on the group or better yet, get in contact with us. We're both on Facebook and come on the show. Heck yeah. And we'll talk perils of Pennsylvania or something. Um, I think this is pretty much going to bring this episode to a close. Very soon you guys will get your first commentary once we figure out what movie we want to do. But I'm really looking forward to that. And yes, sir. Do you have anything else? No, not really. Just uh, stay tuned, you know. Happy Easter, everybody, and thanks for listening. We will be back in two weeks with the next episode.